This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. And now, on with the show. Hey everyone, Chris here for a special bonus episode of We're Watching Here. Normally these bonus episodes are exclusives for our Patreon supporters, but because I'm trying something new here, I wanted to open this one up to everyone. Basically, this new feature will be an occasional set of reviews running between 5 to 10 minutes. It might be for new releases or something Perry or I saw that we just want to talk about, but that might not make sense for an entire podcast episode. Sometimes it will be both Perry and I, sometimes just one of us. Today you're kind of stuck with me. Uh, like I said, this one is going to be free for everyone to kind of give you an idea of what we're doing. Uh, the next one will be beyond the uh, Patreon firewall. So if you like what you're hearing, please subscribe. I think you'll uh, you'll like some of these episodes. So Perry and I will both be back Friday with a new episode. But for this bonus, I wanted to talk a little bit about Toy Story 4. I hope you had the chance to listen to our discussion of Pixar films on the last episode when we both spoke very highly of the Toy Story series, particularly Toy Story 2. You might also recall that we weren't especially enamored with any other Pixar sequels. When you have a studio known for its breathtaking originality, rehashes, no matter how heartrending or funny they might be, just always feel like a disappointment. So when I compiled a ranking of all the Pixar films last week, I was actually surprised just how low even some Pixar sequels I enjoyed, like last year's Incredibles 2, ended up on the list. But the Toy Story movies have always been exceptions. Toy Story 2 is one of Pixar's finest moments. I recently watched this one again with my daughter, and I was stunned how flat Jesse's song knocked me, even after 20 years and multiple viewings. In addition to that, I was reminded just how funny, exciting, and fun the film is, in a way that almost seems too easy. Toy Story had this right out of the gate, that special Pixar touch that combines whimsy, wit, and existential angst. Toy Story 2 was such a perfect film that I was rightly anxious when Toy Story 3 came out 11 years later, and I was shocked then that the Pixar Wizards were able to close the series off in such a moving, powerful fashion. So, you can imagine why I probably wasn't too excited heading into Toy Story 4 last week. Not only was Pixar tempting fate by releasing another Toy Story adventure, it was coming at the end of a long run of sequels that entertained but fell far short of their predecessors, things like Finding Dory or Monsters University or, God forbid, the Cars movies. Add to that that it was adding on to a trilogy that had a perfect conclusion, a point that felt like a definitive ending. And where else could you go? It seemed like Disney making another nostalgic return to the well. Which, of course, if you look at Aladdin and Upcoming Lion King, they love to do. And you can read my full review at Michigan Sports and Entertainment, and I'll link to it in the show notes, but Toy Story 4 really surprised me. It's a very funny, exciting, and yes, moving story. But more than that, it gives us an ending that feels necessary and emotionally resonant without robbing the previous film's conclusion of its power. I use the word epilogue quite a bit in my review, and I think that's the right word. This isn't attempting to write the Toy Story trilogy. It's just one last adventure that gives us some new directions and shadings for these characters. I don't want to re-review the movie here, but I do want to talk about the ending, which means I'll be going into spoilers for this review. While the movie has received rave reviews, including a 98% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes and an 84 on Metacritic, I've seen some division on the film's ending, with some people finding it out of character for Woody. So I thought I would share my thoughts here, and then feel free to chime in on our Facebook page or via email if you agree or disagree. So again, a spoiler warning, if you haven't seen Toy Story 4, I recommend turning this off until you've seen the film, because I will be discussing the ending right now. Still here? All right. So at the end of Toy Story 4, Woody makes the decision to leave Bonnie and his friends and stay with Bo, who's been fending for herself in the wild and is going to explore the world with a traveling carnival and the other lost toys they picked up along the way. Rather than stay with Bonnie until she grows old and then move on to a cycle of other toys and kids, Woody decides to join up with Bo and help lost toys find new kids. I've seen some complain that this ending is out of the blue and out of character for Woody after his commitment to Andy and the other toys in the three previous movies. Josh Larson, co-host of Film Spotting Podcast, he felt the same way, writing on his site, It strikes me as a strangely square move for the series to make, a sudden embrace of traditional romance over the communal vision these movies have always painted. Bo may thrive out on her own, but Woody was never meant for the wild, wild west. His place is the ranch, 
more specifically the corral where lost toys could be gathered and given purpose in community. And I understand what he's saying. The Toy Story movies have always been about existential fears and, and angst, and for them to suddenly let Woody leave because he's pursuing the one who got away seems a bit old-fashioned and a new and slightly less interesting direction for the series. But I actually think that's a misreading of the film. Yes, Woody is happy to be back with Bo, and the film does create a sort of romance for them. But what Woody is really doing is finding his purpose changing, new desires growing, and a new stage on which to pursue his passion. Throughout the Toy Story series, Woody has had two primary drivers, to be there to comfort his kid and to make sure no toy is ever left behind. As we catch up with him, he is Andy's favorite toy, and therefore he's the leader of that group. When we meet him in Toy Story 1, he's head of the gang. He's a protector for the toys, responsible for them, and when Buzz appears, he's afraid of losing that status. What he learns is that he can share the spotlight, that there's enough room in Andy's heart for him and a new friend. In Toy Story 2, he learns that being for her, there for his kid is more important than protecting his heart from the fear of Andy growing older and himself growing obsolete. Woody, as in Toy Story 4, has the option to leave his kid. In this case, to be put into a museum where he'll be admired by people from around the world. He realizes that it's worth being around to see Andy grow up, even though he can't deny that one day he'll be an adult who doesn't need his ragdoll cowboy. And Toy Story 3... That day comes, and Woody's mission turns into being the father figure who keeps the toys together and finding new adventures for them without Andy. It's a movie about letting go. That final scene where Andy gives his toys to Bonnie is moving not just because it's a goodbye, but because it's a celebration of sorts. Woody, Buzz, and the gang have fulfilled their purpose. They were there with their kid into adulthood, and Bonnie promises new adventures for them, a new home for them. But something about that ending always bugged me. Yes, it closed the trilogy perfectly, but it also left questions about Woody's future. Was he going to be just passed her off from kid to kid? Would he really believe his status as a leader would always be in check? And could Woody ever just be satisfied as being just another toy, tossed aside with the ease of Wheezy or Bo? In Toy Story 4, Woody is in a different place. Bonnie doesn't seem particularly interested in the cowboy. When she does reach for him, it's to pull off his sheriff's badge and give it to Jesse. He spends most his time in the closet with other toys Bonnie is interested in. Uh, Bonnie isn't interested in, sorry. He's no longer the leader of the gang. Dolly runs through him, and he's consistently chided over his attempts to insert himself into Bonnie's reality. Really, at this point, Woody's kind of superfluous to Bonnie. His purpose has been fulfilled with Andy. Now he has to watch other toys take the lead with a new kid while he gathers dust. But throughout the movie, we also see that Woody's belief in the noble pursuit of being a toy is his greatest strength, and it both helps kids and toys. He talks Forky out of his despair and makes him understand that he's the most important toy in Bonnie's life at the moment. His entire quest this time is spurred not just by him wanting to get back to Bonnie, but to get Forky back to her. He understands she may not miss him, but that she'll be inconsolable if this weird spork isn't returned. And we also see in his dealings with Gabby Gabby that he understands just how much healing she can have if she's allowed to be someone's toy. He willingly gives up his voice box so that she can go home with Harmony. And when that doesn't work, he promises to take her to Bonnie until he finds a lost girl at the carnival and unites her with Gabby Gabby. The movie shows Woody discovering a new purpose, new adventures so that he can fulfill his desire to make kids happy and still make sure no toy gets left behind, even on a bigger scale than before. While this might not be what the Woody of Toy Stories 1 through 3 would do, the character finds new yearnings, desires, and opportunities. When he hesitates at the end, he's not worried about himself, but about Bonnie. It's Buzz who tells him she'll be fine, that Woody has permission to go have new adventures. I find that a beautiful ending, this reimagining of new possibilities for Woody. It's much better than the thought of him gathering dust in a storage bin for five decades, and it solidifies the themes of parenthood that the Toy Story movies have always had. While the first film might be better read as a story about sibling rivalry, starting with Toy Story 2, the series became an allegory for raising kids who might not appreciate you or always want you around. It became about the heartache of watching your baby grow up and stop being your little buddy, taking steps toward independence where you might no longer be as essential. The reason Toy Story 3 hit so many people like a sledgehammer is not just because of that final sequence, but because of the moment where Andy's mom looks around his room and sees her boys heading off to college. We'd spent 15 years with these characters, 
Likely, many parents who had taken their kids to see Toy Story were sending them off to college the same summer as Toy Story 3 came out. Before Linklater gave us boyhood, the Toy Story movies were reminding us of the onward march of time and how quickly it all goes. And so Toy Story 4 is a conclusion that says we're not finished when we become empty nesters or when we watch that new generation come in at work. It lets us know it's okay for our dreams to change, that there are new passions to explore, that the adventure might in many ways just be beginning. It feels like a more conclusive ending than we got with Toy Story 3, if only because we know that even if Toy Story 5 comes down the road, it's going to be something new, an adventure we haven't seen in this series before. Mostly, it gives Woody a new goal and adventure. It gives him permission to explore instead of beckoning him home again. And really, what I love about these movies is that we can have these conversations about movies about toys. Never in Toy Story 4 did I feel like the characters were going through the motions or that Disney was just trotting out beloved IP to make some money, although, let's be honest, that was also happening. These characters have become so well-defined over nearly 25 years that spending time with them feels like visiting old friends, and characters that are just pixelated plastic have real depth, nuance, and emotion. The fact that we can argue about whether a ragdoll cowboy did something in line with his character's traditional motivations is proof of how beautiful a thing Pixar has made with this. In fact, my only complaint about the movie is that some characters I love, such as Rex or Buzz, get a bit shortchanged here. I wanted to have some more fun with them. A thought occurred to me this weekend that the Toy Story characters might be the closest thing this generation has to the Muppets that I grew up with. Like the Muppets, there are characters who are so obviously imaginary. And yet they are so full of their own neuroses, flaws, and anxieties that they feel utterly real to us. I find myself not thinking about the work Tom Hanks or Tim Allen do here, which, as always, is great, but about the decisions made by Buzz and Woody. They are real to me in a way that Kermit, Piggy, or Fozzie are. And it takes a special kind of magic to pull that off. My biggest fear for Toy Story 4 was that it wouldn't feel a part of the other films. Instead, it delighted me by fitting strongly inside of them, a side of them, and it's my favorite film so far this summer. So I encourage you to read my review, and I also have a ranking of the Pixar movies uh, that you might want to read, and I'll link to them both in the show notes. Um, but I really enjoyed Toy Story 4. I, I think it is a a, a a sequel that feels in line with what Pixar does, which isn't always the case. And it felt just as special and just as magic as the original films. And yeah, I, I, I hope you see it. I, I think it is a really good movie, and I... You know, I'm in that place again where I don't want another film, but I've learned not to count them out. That's all I have today. Perry and I will be back on Friday with a discussion about the 1979 Bob Fosse film, All That Jazz. And next week, I'm going to try to have another of these bonus episodes talking about Spider-Man Far From Home and our current age of the spider flick. But remember, it will be a Patreon exclusive only, so if you like what you're hearing, head on over there and join up. In the meantime, find us at Big Heads Media or wherever you find your podcasts. Follow the conversation on Facebook or Watching Cast on Twitter. And you can follow Perry on Twitter at Perry Loves Film. And I'm at Mere Christianity. We'll see you on Friday.